Okay, thank you for joining us for part two of our Double Empathy Symposium. Uh, this time we're back in the UK, in London. Uh, I'm happy to say I'm with Damien Milton. So we can talk a little bit about your reflections on what we discussed in Montreal and maybe talk a bit more broadly about uh, double empathy and perhaps how you envision the future of this uh, research. Hello everyone. Yeah, there was uh, some really interesting points made in the symposium and uh, some really great work that I think all of you have been doing. Um, So I want to applaud you all on that front. And there were so many questions and issues that came up from the symposium. So I've made some notes to (laughs) go through. The first point which came up with Kerry anns work, but also later on, was um, how people attribute uh, ways of being to other people or ideas about others. And it struck me the terms such as awkward and unattractive as to why that might put someone off wanting to talk to someone else. Um, Or even why they might be negative associations, especially with awkward. Um, To give an example, it made me think of a story of many years ago, the second time I tried to begin a degree course and on the first evening uh, there was this rather posh black tie wine reception thing and I turned up looking rather scruffy and out of place um, and not being able to meet the social etiquette so I was in the corner looking very awkward in came uh, someone, a punk, with a Mohican bright pink hairdo, uh, with a chain round his neck and a t-shirt with the exploited written on it. So I walked over to him and my first words were, hello, you look like the most normal person in here, which struck up a, a friendship which lasted through uh, my degree course there. So the very thing that he was also an outsider and wanted to show that and was awkward in that environment made me feel more connected, not less. And this was before I was diagnosed as autistic myself. So is awkward a negative thing? Uh, For me, it isn't. And the meanings of attributions that we put on other people and what connects us to others. So, in a sense, awkward is an attractive thing for some people. Another interesting point from Kerry Ann's work was uh, the condition of the kind of blank slate environment, so they weren't given instructions about what to talk about. And to me, that I thought, oh, that it's going to cause problems for autistic people in initiating conversations. And there must have been delays or some which had a lot of difficulty getting going. But it was lovely to hear about the kind of matching up and connecting people had over their interests, like the story about the Dungeons and Dragons pairing, I thought was something I could connect to on an an intuitive level in um, how autistic people with shared interests might bond over them sometimes quite quickly Um, and these passions we have in life are quite important to us and just hearing that I empathise to put it bluntly (laughs) so that was interesting There was also a point which came up, which I actually wrote about in my first paper about the double empathy problem, and that's how uh, attempts to empathise with autistic people, um, trying too hard, can feel invasive. So uh, 
when people are trying to empathise with you and getting it wrong, it's intrusive and an invasive feeling. And that was mentioned in the symposium in, in the study, so I thought that was an interesting uh, point to reflect on as well. Um, so what's comfortable for different people in social interaction and why? That work, I thought, it was really, really interesting stuff, but like the others, there's kind of, and work in this area, and generally in academia, you get more questions than answers, so it's where to go from here, I think, is something I'll get back to. Um, uh, I also thought Catherine's work was very interesting. Um, and uh, how people knew the sort of diagnostic status of people from the outset and the conversation about what it would look like if that wasn't known. And I think that experiment needs to be done, really. Um, I think it was also interesting the question posed regarding what's driving the breakdown in the diffusion chain, what's causing the mismatch. Um, and that needs more work, really. And there was a lot of discussion and ruminating in the symposium uh, podcast about the processes or the how of communication, like social cues, nonverbal cues, things like that. But to me, there's also uh, issues in terms of the content or the what people are communicating about and what's meaningful to them. Um, and that comes from past experience and interests in life um, and how those shape uh, one's perceptions and narratives. And thinking about Dinah Murray's interest model, uh, predictive coding theories of perception and how differences there or the combination of those ideas would play out, I think would, is another area to look at. So I, I looked up predictive coding and I'm still not entirely sure what it is. <laughs> I think that's one of the problems is kind of it's gets not. complicated. It's a kind of seeing the brain and the mind as more embodied and it's neuroscientific work and modelling around how uh, perceptions are created partly through perceiving through the senses but through prior information, mental schemas, whatever you want to call it. And so we we create our uh, world as we live it and test things out. And part of the theory is the brain is trying to reduce prediction errors. So um, a kind of self-validation exercise mm. with testing things out in the environment. If you think of any differences in the sensory information coming in, the use of prior information, how they the two mixed together, will have a knock-on effect in terms of so the experience of the social life world and interactions with others. And therefore, breakdowns are likely to occur to me in such cases. There's many areas which could be tested, though. So measuring interest and how that affects might be quite difficult but some of the things mentioned by the others things like cognitive load I think would have an impact um, on autistic interaction and that sensory inputs and outputs as it were. Mm. In terms of predictive errors with the double empathy problem, I'd say both parties are making prediction errors in regard to one another. Um, and by trying to empathise, by putting yourself in the shoes of the other person, 
it could take you further away from understanding them because their experiences and yours might be very, very different. Um, so when that mismatch occurs, there's a kind of dissonance which the brain tries to repair or make sense of or rationalise. And to me, this brings into something that Sue raised, and that's power in a relationship, or a, as Wittgenstein would say, a language game, and who has the power to define a situation or an interaction as normal or not. And that, I think, affects things. And Sue mentioned uh, whiteness and maleness, I think, in her comments. And it's basically alluding to ableism, this uh, taken for granted uh, your way of being is the natural and normal way things are and shared by others.